you. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys, that, yeah, that's awesome and totally uncalled for, but so appreciated. If you're new here, you're like, what is going on? Well, the, this church just loves me. That's all. That's all. Okay. No, if you are new, I've been, I've been out for a, a bit dealing with um, some, some uh, radiation therapy and six weeks of that. And so I, I'm grateful to be back. I really do feel like this past week, like God just gave me my strength back, gave me my energy back. Gave, I rounded the corner. I just, man, I'm so grateful, and I'm truly grateful to be back with you. I, I missed you. Church, you are awesome, and I'm glad to be worshiping God with you today. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, I was thinking about this past week. It was one of those weeks where uh, all of a sudden uh, things come into focus, you know, like what really matters kind of comes back into the center. And this past week, probably a lot of us did some thinking, and you know what? We, we really discovered again what matters most in this life. And what we discovered that matters most in this life this week is, <laughs> is it too soon? Too soon? <laughs> Right, we, we, we all found out what really matters in this world, that there are some things out there worth going and fighting for, and apparently that's one of them, right? And you know what else I discovered, though? Personally, I discovered, because look what I have in my garage, I'm rich, baby! I had two 24 packs in my garage before the TP apocalypse hit the region. So, listen, listen, if you're desperate, $500. Make a deal. Anyway, it was... It, you know, kind of joking aside, it, it was a week when all of a sudden there's a, a whole bunch going on in the news and uh, things getting stirred up and people using words like pandemic and whatnot. And I want to just take a moment and just briefly address that. And, and here's what I would say in a summary. I'd say what we need to do is resist the hysteria and ramp up the hygiene. Like kind of if you summed it up, like that would be a good summary, right? Let's resist the hysteria, but let's also ramp up the hygiene. First of all, let's resist the hysteria. There's no need to be stirred up with a spirit of fear when the scripture says our Father has not given us a spirit of fear. So we resist hysteria. We don't need to go buy 10 pallets of toilet paper, people, right? We just don't need to, right? But we do appropriately ramp up the hygiene. And, and so on that note, I want you to know at Center Point we uh, are, are, uh, are taking strong measures to ensure campus hygiene. Like we're just doing what we should to make sure that there's a, a healthy place here. And at the same time, I'd also say this might be a season in which to hold back on the greeting one another with a holy kiss, because I know how you do, right? No, we, maybe this is a season where we just don't do as much of that, and maybe we opt for different ways of greetings. Like, hey, Aaron, come help me out. Get up here for a second. I just so I'm going to just show you some options, like some alternatives. This is, you know, we can watch, no, no, no. We can do the elbow pop. Hey, hey, you can do it either way, left, right. Or if you don't like the elbow pop, you can do uh, the low five kick. Hey, hey, man, what's going on? What's up? Hey, just the, we, no, that's like corny if you start, start dancing. But, uh, so you could do that. Or if you don't even want to do any of those, you could just get your Asian on and just be like, yeah. You know, yeah, you can do that too. But, but what that does, it sends a message, doesn't it? It sends a message. I don't want to touch you, but I do respect you, right? <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much, Aaron. Yay. Um, I know for some of us, we really don't care, and we're glad. We're like, <laughs> right? But then there's other of us on the other end of the spectrum that would just right now prefer not as much contact, and it's fine. And just maybe choose some of those alternatives, and, 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 and let's, let's definitely resist the hysteria. Let's also ramp up the hygiene, but more than those two things, let's raise up the name of Jesus. I mean, I believe that as the church, that's what we're here to do, to raise up the name of Jesus over our own physical bodies, over our households, over our church, over Murrieta Valley High School, over this region, right? So let's take a moment right now and let's raise up the name of Jesus together. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are our shield and very great reward. I thank you, God, that you are our covering and protection, and we declare the name of Jesus over our bodies, over our families, over our households, over our blood, <laughs> over Marietta Valley High School. We declare the name of Jesus. On the count of three, I want you to just shout his name, Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus! We declare your great name over our valley, and we trust in your protective hand. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so uh, I get to wrap up the series that we've been doing called The Pathway. And this is an important one, this series, because it's a little bit of a let's talk about how we do family together kind of a series. So we have this mission of loving and leading people to a life-changing connection with Christ. That's what we do. But within that, what we are engaging in is discipleship. And so what we've done is kind of stepped back and, and looked at the big picture and, and come to the conclusion that there's four main aspects of that discipleship pathway that we want to always be urging one another further along in. And so it's these four buckets, right, if you will, worship, connect, serve, influence, worship, connect, serve, influence. And as we are a church together, those are the things that comprise our discipleship pathway. So let me just kind of run it down with you in case you missed any one of the, the weeks. So the first part is worship. And that is not just about 22 minutes of songs on a Sunday morning. It, what it's about is it's about being the kind of people that are cultivating a lifestyle where we are on the lookout for an encounter with God at any moment and where we are eager to live a lifestyle of putting God first and giving him our adoration and our affection in every way that we can. That, that's what we're about. And also when we're gathering together, going for it. Like, we're not going to just kick back and go, oh, well, it's nice to listen to those other people sing that song. <laughs> but instead, we're going to jump and shout and give God our glory and our praise together. That's what we're going to do. Worship. It's about what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He, he, he framed that as pivotal, as, as something to anchor our, our expression of our faith in worship. Okay, the next part is the word connect. Everyone say Connect. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking to heart what Jesus said. He said, I'm giving you a new command. Love one another. How are you going to do that if all you do is sit in rows, you know? There's got to be environments and opportunities where we're, we're making circles with one another, where we're coming together and being in community and connecting. And so we, we make the challenge clear as often as we can. Get in a group to grow because when we connect, we are urging one another along. We are giving other, uh, each other support and challenge and love and care all at the same time. And so if you haven't yet, be on the lookout for your opportunity to get in a group to grow. The third part of the pathway, it's serve. Everyone say serve. serve. And you know what quickly comes to mind for me? It's just Jesus all of a sudden grabbing a towel and washing dusty feet. It was not a religious ceremony. It was just something that needed to be done. And he's given us an example, saying, this is what's normal for my people. You serve each other. That's what you do. And so the challenge for you, if you're a part of Centerpoint Church, is to say, I probably ought to step up and serve to build up the church body. That's particularly what we have in mind. And so at Centerpoint, here's how you do it. You do CP 101. It will cost you one hour of your life. But then it'll give you an orientation to all the different ways you could serve in this church body. And if you are somebody who's been kicking back and letting everyone else carry all the weight, I want to push back on that a little bit. And I want to challenge you to take your step. And maybe you can only do one weekend a month or something like that, but do what you can to be a part of the movement of God in this church. But the final part of that pathway is influence. Everyone say influence. 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 We, we just believe that what happens at center point should not stay at center point. Like if there's going to be all this pouring out of God's goodness and power and love and mercy, it's not meant to be just put a, a bushel over it and hide it here. It's meant to be flowing out from this place. And so we choose the word influence because it has the idea of flow. And so it's not about, we just gotta strive to do something out there in the world, but instead it's about flow. It's about the blessing and goodness of God flowing into our lives, but then also through our lives to change the world around us. So that's what I get to share about today. And I want us to, uh, to take some time to get into the scriptures together. So open up your Bible or your Bible app to the Old Testament, to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And I want you to open there now to Genesis chapter 12. And as you're turning to Genesis chapter 12, when, when I think about the word influence, what I believe that God is looking for 
is for people like us who are growing in our own experience of encounter with God, so much so that we are more and more being filled by the flow, the blessing of God, and we recognize that it's not just about us getting blessed, but that it's about that blessing flowing into and then through our lives. And I think we see a snapshot of that in Genesis 12. This is a, a moment where God speaks to Abraham. At this particular moment, his name hasn't been changed yet, so he's still called Abram or Abram. And it's this little moment, it's just a few verses, but it captures a picture that, that I think has something to do with you and me. Here's why. Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. Somebody say amen. amen. We, we have spiritual ancestors, the Jewish people. Abraham is the father of the Jewish people, but... Galatians 3, 7 says that Abraham is actually the father of all who believe, talking about believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me just ask a little question right now. By way of a show of hands, how many of you are believers in Jesus? Okay, I thought there might be a few. So listen, what that means is that you are children of Abraham. Amen. And so Abraham is your legacy. Like the inheritance of Abraham is your inheritance. The legacy of Abraham is your legacy. And I want you to actually lay hold of that, grab hold of that. Just decide today, okay, that when I read the Bible about Abraham and how God worked in his life, that's a type and shadow forecasting the ways that God may want to work in my life too. Because my life is marked as one who is a, a, a child of Abraham under that same flow of God's blessing. Okay, so you got all of that in mind. Now let's jump into the scriptures, to Genesis chapter 12. This is, uh, this is God's word for you and me today. Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to, Abr uh, to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name Great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they'd accumulated, the people they'd acquired in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Oh, and big, uh, you know, big picture, what we're looking at is, is the story of the people of God the moving into the promised land. And that in and of itself <laughs> is a picture of really the kind of thing that is meant to be on our minds for our lives as well. A movement into what God has for us that we haven't attained yet. A movement into an experience of the promises of God and living in that promised land, so to speak, where, where we're following God into his greatest blessing in our lives. But here's what I recognize, that that, that blessing that, that ultimately is gonna be a flow or an influence of the blessing of God that changes the world, it requires movement. Go back with me for just a minute and trace this out. In verse 1, this is what we, we read. It, it, actually, why don't you read it out loud with me. Ready? Go. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. There is a sense in which for influence to occur, movement is required. Influence won't happen through passivity. Yeah. There's got to be an, a responsiveness. It's, it's clear, right? God moves first in this moment. God moves first, and the way God moves is by speaking. God moves by saying, Abram, I want you to go. God moves first, and then it's time for Abram to move. And this is, this is, in a sense, the message that I came to bring to you today. I want you to embrace a resolve about what we're seeing in the scriptures. And it pertains to influence and what is required of you and me. And, and the resolve is simply this, that I resolve to embrace the movement that influence requires. God moves, and I move. God moves, and I move. I want you to just say, God moves, I move. 
Say it again. God moves, I move. God moves, I move. God moves, I move. And I think what we're seeing in this scripture is a picture of something that you and I need to step more into the reality of. Hearing the word of God coming into our lives. God moving first in our lives saying, I have something for you. But kicking back and spending eight hours playing video games ain't going to get you there. <laughs> it's time for you to move. Let's not let, let influence be relegated to something a few famous people do in social media. Like Let's be the people who are moving with our God moving in us, bringing something good into this world through our willingness to show up. You know what? I asked you before, how many of you are believers in Jesus? And most of us raised our hands. And so since you're a believer in Jesus, let me just remind you of what Jesus prayed for. Jesus is with his disciples near the end of his journey on this earth. And in the end of the Gospel of John, there's this moment where Jesus kind of steps aside, apparently, from the disciples and just begins praying. And he's praying, God, God. Give them all of your glory, you know? And then he says this one thing. I can just imagine Jesus uh, out maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane, surrounded by some olive trees and, and just praying. And what he says in John 17, 18 is this. He says, Father, just as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. And you know who he's thinking about? You. He's thinking about his church, you and me, and what he envisioned is that we would be people who recognize that we have an assignment from heaven to go into this world with the power of the love of God and to make it better, to take the power and love of God and that it would flow into our lives and then through our lives to change this planet for the glory of God. That's really what Jesus envisioned. He said, as the Father sends me, John 20, 21, as the Father sends me, so I send you, right? He, he has this vision of who you and I are as people who are empowered by his presence and on assignment to be light, to be salt, to be the ones who would bring the fire. That's what you're made for, to be the kind of people who are alive with the blessing of God in your life, and then you carry it and let it flow through you to a world around you that is definitely in need. And, and this, is, this is a beautiful thing that I see in the scriptures, and I want to make sure I catch it, right? So verse 1 again, it said, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I've got to pause here and just say this. To truly step into influence, movement is required. And it probably looks like moving in ways that are unfamiliar. Maybe ways that take you out of just being comfy and cozy where you were. I mean, that's what I see taking place here at the essence of it, is, is a movement into a place that you don't even have sureness or certainty of how it's even going to work out yet, but you go. And you go knowing that you've got a faithful God who's got a good plan to bring his blessing through your life. But keep reading. Verse 2, it says, I will, this is God speaking, to your spiritual forefather, about the kind of legacy that you should also anticipate. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. And what I love about this is it's in, a, in a, just a few simple phrases, it reflects the kind of engagement God wants to have with us as his people. He has an eager desire to come into your life and actually raise you up with his love and his mercy and his power and his blessing, so much so that it would be said of you as well, I'm making your name great. I care about you that much because he really is a good dad. And, and it's God expressing that that is his desire, in fact, is to work in your life to raise you up out of where you've been stuck, to set you free from what you've been imprisoned with, and to fill you with such a, a fragrance of heaven that, that you become the aroma everywhere of Christ to the world around you. Like, this is the desire of God to move in you, to move in you, but not only for your sake, for the sake of the world that needs his touch flowing through you. And, but it's not either or, it's both and. It's God moving in you to bless you 
And he says it to Abram, I will bless you. And that is not illegal to desire or anticipate. It's good. But, but we don't stop there and settle for just, yay, more blessing for me. We move to where God always wants us to move to. Looking, on the lookout for how we can be a blessing as we've been blessed. And, and so we embrace that movement. God moves, I move. God moves, I move. And we watch the blessing flow as we do. So I want to just uh, share some, some uh, convictions with you. And I, I penned this down just as a, a simple declaration of what I hope that we would embrace together as a kind of a resolve about this whole thing. And I want you to just say this out loud with me. These are words that I wrote that I hope that you'll get your heart around. And just would you just say it with me uh, one time right now? Out loud, ready, go. I've been blessed to be a blessing. God's love will flow through my church to bless a hurting and lost world, and I will be a part of it. I pursue the experience of God's blessing flowing into my life and then through my life. I want God's blessing for others to flow through me. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? Like that's a declaration that you can make and, and it creates a sense of anticipation for what God can do to a, through a yielded life. And I hope that all of us would be living yielded lives that God can move through, and then move in and then through. And so at Centerpoint, we, uh, you know, we, we lately have been referring to this idea of influence in terms of application with the simple phrase, CP, go. And we want to look for opportunities where we can step into the movement of the people God has always had in mind. So for example, uh, we partner with Project Touch so that we can take care of the poor and the homeless right here in our valley, as we should. We take, uh, we take opportunity to uh, do the, the Hope Convalescent Ministry, to reach out to uh, those who are elderly and not able to come to church, but to be there for them. We look for opportunities to go into this world near, but we also look for chances to take the gospel of Jesus far. I mean, we got trips to Belize and Costa Rica and Kenya and places where we're serving and Mexico, uh, but sometimes... Uh, we need to look for opportunities to serve and to make a difference and to let that blessing flow uh, in ways that don't necessarily call for getting on an expensive plane ride to go somewhere far away. And over the years, I've heard about this organization called Compassion International, and I just, I, I just kind of didn't do much about it. I knew about Compassion, but not really the details. Last year, I got a chance to learn more about Compassion. And Compassion is an organization that has a simple mission, and it's releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. Releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. That's what they're there to do. And, and what, they, what they do is they are, are all around the world in third world countries looking in particular to partner with local churches. That's their model. Find a local Jesus-proclaiming church and let that local church identify the at-risk poor children and then form a partnership with people like us over here that might be able to help and create a, a sponsorship that allows children to be released from poverty, children that otherwise uh, wouldn't do very well. So I had a chance in November last year to go to Thailand on a short missions trip with Compassion International. And so got to see up close and personal what Compassion does. And so we would go to village after village after village where they had a, a, a Compassion program and it would be a local church that was thriving, proclaiming Jesus, and with the church, they would form a, a child development center. And through the sponsorship, every child that's sponsored, and I met all of these kids, right, they, they get nutrition, they get a meal, they get health care, they get education, they get social services to make sure they don't fall through the cracks, they get support for their life as needed when needs come up. And I watched it just time and time again in all of these villages, like these kids that are getting raised up. And it, just because of where they happen to have been born, they got a, a tougher start than a lot of us, but this organization comes in and allows there to be a lift that's pretty amazing. So there's this one village we went to where I met this little girl named Yuba. And Yuba's sponsored by a family in Oklahoma 
Uh, but we actually got to get to know her, and then we got to go to her home. So we went down these windy little trails, and finally the trail opened up to Yuba's house. And when we got there, I just have to tell you, like, I just kind of stood back for a minute and just looked at her home and thought, man, that's, that's kind of rough. That, I mean, that's a lot different than the house that you and me probably live in, right? So, so I remember going over to her little house here and had to kind of climb up a ladder to get in. And as I walked into the house, it's three bedrooms. It's probably about 500, 600 square feet or so. Three rooms and 14 family members live there. And there's no couches, there's no chairs, there's no tables, there's just no room for any of that. There's a little open room with a, a, a straw mat to just sit in a circle on. And so I just sat there with Yuba and her father and her mother and had a little conversation. And through the translator, I asked the father, how can I pray for you, sir? And he said, please pray for me to find work. He's in construction. And if there's nothing to build, he doesn't earn his three bucks a day. Three bucks a day. Heading out and building stuff. I mean, it's rough. But I noticed in, in their little house, on this wall there was a calendar. That was the only thing in there. It was just one light bulb kind of hanging on a wire and a calendar. And on this wall there was a, a, a little photograph. And I said, who is that? What's that? And she, uh, her eyes lit up and she went and Yuba got the picture off the wall and she said, this is my family, my sponsor family. And it was this family in Oklahoma, you know, whose picture is up on the wall in that little village in Thailand. And, and, and it was the only thing on the wall except for the calendar. And her eyes lit up and her father's eyes lit up. And he said, thank God for that family. Because of them, my daughter gets to eat. <laughs> you know, that when you hear something like that from a father sitting with that dad and his daughter, it messes with you. It messed with me. And, and I was just sitting on the floor, and as I'm stepping back, I could feel the little bamboo slats that I'm walking on, like, cracking under my feet and realizing, my gosh, like, this, we need to partner with Compassion and these kids. And so this is Compassion Weekend at Centerpoint because I want to challenge you with God's heart for taking care of the poor. I, I'm grateful we do that here locally already. But I think it's also important that we would do that further away too, as a matter of influence, as a matter of allowing the blessing of God to flow through us to where it's needed. So the sponsoring of a child, I mean, it's $38 a month to sponsor a girl like Yuba, but what that brings about for her and kids like her is amazing. But rather than me just kind of rattle on about that, uh, I have a guest here today that I've invited to come share with you. Uh, his name is Gerald Lorenzo, and he grew up in Dominican Republic uh, as a child who was sponsored by Compassion, and God worked powerfully there, and I want you to hear from him personally. So would you welcome Gerald Lorenzo? Come on up, brother. Thank you. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Young. Uh, what I'm listening is to be here and share my story as a Compassion alumni. Uh, as pastors say, God moved me from the Dominican Republic, and I moved. And that's the reason why I am here. The reason why I am here is because I want God's blessing for others to flow through me. Amen. So I am pretty sure that a lot of you guys know what a roller coaster is. And if you know what is a roller coaster, let me tell you something. That was my life when I was a child. When I was four years old, my father left the house, and my mother had to raise my brother and me all by herself. And from that age, I never knew what it was like to have a father. Everything changed in my life because I had to deal with extreme poverty, with no money to eat, no money to dress, and no money to have an education. But thanks God, and that's one of the things that I want to tell you today, God's plan is more powerful than poverty. And that's why I'm here. Um, unfortunately, I grew up in a lousy neighborhood in Santo Domingo where drugs are illegal weapons, 
crime and poverty were my daily bread. Um, during my childhood, I saw how the traffickers were selling drugs in the corner by my house. Uh, do not have a father, it is hard. But it is harder when you don't mean anything to your father. I remember that my father, he never called me to say happy birthday. He was a police officer, and he never had time for me. I remember one day, it was a raining day, I was supposed to go to my school, but I called my father, and he asked me to pass by the police station to get some money to, to buy food. And after 14 attempts, he asked me to pass by the police station to get some money. And when I got to the police station, my father wasn't there. So I was waiting my father from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., and he never showed up. I don't know if you can imagine a child, 11 years old, waiting for his father in a police station. That was me. One of my dad's co-workers, he saw me sitting there, and he decided to call my father. When he passed me the phone, I told to my father, hey, dad, I am here from 7 a.m., it is 5 p.m., and I haven't had breakfast, and I haven't eaten. His answer was, I don't care. Just go to your home. I haven't eaten anything either. So that day, I felt like it didn't make sense to leave. I was asking me, why am I here? Three years later, I knew that my father was living during 15 years, just at 10 to 15 minutes from my house, and he never stopped by because he never wanted to take care of me. As a result of that, I had to walk around six kilometers to go to my school every day from Monday to Friday with my broken shoes. I had to ask my neighbor for cans of soda and exchange them for bread and milk at the grocery store to eat the only meal of the day. I had to sell juice and empanadas on the street to survive, and I didn't have a bed to sleep on. And everything because my father was never there to support me. So I was living in desperation, without hope, in the middle of the poverty. And my mom, she was desperate. She didn't know what to do. But she used to work in a Christian school, and they had a compassion program. She applied for, and they accepted me. And from that time, everything changed in my life. Because we found a place that provides food, transportation, and uniform for my brother and me. Something that is interesting is that my mother, my brother, and I accepted Jesus Christ through Compassion International. Wow. Wow. And now, my mother, she is a co-pastor in a church in the Dominican Republic. Wow. My brother, he plays the piano and he is working as a Compassion external host for Compassion International in the Dominican Republic. Wow. My first bed was given by Compassion Amen. when I was 12 years old. And that was the first time that I was able to sleep on a bed. My family, we are a great example that a whole family can be changed just sponsoring a child. My sponsor, Brian Bilson, I never met my sponsor. I never met him. I just know that he is from London, United Kingdom. But through the letters, we create a bond of a father and son that I never knew before. And when my father didn't call me to say happy birthday, 
I was receiving a letter from him telling me, Jada, we are here in London, my family and I, and we want to wish you the best of the birthday, and you are important for us. Let me tell you something. To have Jesus in my life changed everything until today. And thanks God that one day a man decided to influence in my life. I am here today. What is happening now is that my life is not a roller coaster anymore. I am married to a beautiful girl from the DR. And there is an important part of our life, and it's our first baby girl, Valerie. She's 10 months. But as I, as I mentioned before, thanks that one day a man from London, United Kingdom, decided to influence in my life, I'm not going to repeat the same story as my father. Because one day, a man decided to raise his hand and say, I want to sponsor Gerald Lorenzo from the DR. What is happening now is that I have a bachelor's degree in business management thanks to Compassion International. I have a certification in Christian leadership uh, from the Leadership Development Program of Compassion International. I have a certification in public policy process, and I am the youth minister of my church. The next photo that you will see is about my mother. Last year, she was diagnosed with something called Chiari malformation type 2. This is a small tumor in the spinal cord. We were trying to find a doctor in the DR, but we didn't find a doctor there. So she came here to the United States. We went to a hospital in Miami, and the doctor said, hey, we can perform the surgery for her, but the cost is $50,000. Two weeks after, I received a call from a girl, and she told me, hey, Gerald, how are you? And I said, I'm good. She said, it's New Year, Lynn Vargas. I say, oh, hi, how are you? And she say, I'm calling you because I am here with your mom. And I want to tell you that your mom is in God's hand. And I say, yes, thank you. And she say, I just want to tell you that I am neurosurgeon and that I'm going to do, I'm going to perform the surgery for your mom. But the most important thing here is that she is a former sponsored child of Compassion International. So, that's awesome. This surgery was scheduled to take seven hours and just took three hours. And she said, I don't know what happened, but when we started to prefer the surgery for your mom, she started to sing, and when we finished the surgery, he continued singing and glorifying the name of God. Sometimes people ask me about my relationship with my father. And the last picture that you are going to see now is about my father and me. This is the only picture that I have with my father in my entire life. And it was taken in 2017. God allowed me to go to my father's house and forgive him and preach him the gospel of God. Because when Jesus comes into your life, everything has to change. Everything has to change. And let me tell you that. This is not about the money. This is not about the food. This is not about the transportation. It is about Jesus Christ in the life of those children. Yeah. Right. It is about Jesus Christ. Amen. So, you will agree with me with that. Um, 
when you sponsor a child, you are not only sponsoring a child, you are changing a life, you are changing as my life, you are changing a family as my family, and you are transforming an entire generation as my baby generation. Today, you have some child packet from Haiti. We are in the same island, but we have different situation. Here, in those packets that you have, there are many children that we can choose their future. Today, we can decide if we want that those children can be the next doctor, the next pastor, the next prophet of Haiti, or probably the next president of Haiti. But the good thing here is that without your help, we cannot release children from poverty. And keep that in mind. Jesus, the church, and you are a combination more powerful than poverty. Amen. Thank you. Wow. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Um, on the floor, underneath every third chair or so, there should be a packet like this. And I'd like to ask you to grab that right now. Uh, hopefully there are still enough. Uh, look around and try to find one and maybe pass one to someone else. Kind of one per family-ish. But I want you to just take a moment and look at this card. They're all different because they're each the card for that particular child. I want you to just look at this child on, on that card for a moment. Try to read their name. Maybe it's a little difficult to, to read. Maybe even do the math on when they were born and figure out how old they are. But I, I want you to just recognize this is a child who right now is a little bit like how Gerald was before compassion. I mean, did you catch what he shared about you know, compassion gave them a bed when they were 12 years old, and it was the first time they slept on a bed. I mean, that's reality for some of these kids. And to sponsor a child is to step up and say, God, I want your blessing to flow into my life, but then also through my life and into the life of this little one. And I want to encourage you to consider sponsoring a child. But, but right now, what I want to ask you to do is take a moment and pray for this one. Literally take one minute, and whether you're going to sponsor that child or not, could you at least carry that child in your heart for one minute and pray God's blessing over their life? And maybe ask the Lord as you're praying, God is sponsoring this child for $38 a month, something that you'd call me to do. And just take that one minute right now. Would you pray for that child? Let's do that right now. God, thank you for every measure of blessing that you've allowed to flow into our lives. And God, we get it. When you bless us, it's because you're a good dad and you want us to be blessed, but it's also because you desire to see us be a blessing. Lord, I pray that you would, you would personally, God, allow some of us to either feel that sense of stirring to sponsor this child or, or not and that we'd know what to do because you are moving in us. And that God, as you move, we would then move. In Jesus' name, amen.